the bottom line is we need to get paid, right? So think about that client. Do you all have a vision in your head of what that client looks like? Yeah? How many of you at this point in time have a practice full of those clients by a show of hands? Yeah, exactly. How many of you have at least one? And those are the clients we say every day when we get off the phone, oh my God, I want to clone you, right? I love you. You value me. I want to clone you. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. I am going to talk about how to attract those best clients, the ones that you want to clone because you love them so much because they're easy to work with, right? They value you. You value them. It's just a great relationship. Knowing who your target market is and knowing how to attract them uh, can help you increase your profits pretty much immediately by as much as 300%. I have seen that happen with my clients. Just narrowing in on your target market can have that much of an impact on your practice, believe it or not. So I'm gonna talk a lot about that over the next three hours. How many, how much time do I have? 30 minutes, okay. So I'm gonna tell you a story about one of my clients. Um, and I think some of you, I'm telling you this story because I think that it might resonate with some of you. I met Dr. Muhammad about a year and a half ago. He has been in business about seven years. His practice is, was a million and a half when I met him. A lot of people might say, wow, you know, that's pretty good, you know? And that's not bad. Some people might be happy with that. Some people might not, right? He wasn't, that's why he hired me. And one of the reasons he hired me, I was like, well, Dr. Mohammed, you know, what, what's going on? You know, a well, million and a half, what do you want? He's like, well, one thing I want more zeros in that bank account, six isn't enough, seven? I mean, six, six zeros isn't enough, um, or whatever it is. It's not enough, I want more. But most importantly, I'm not doing the type of work I want to be doing. I am highly trained and highly schooled and highly um, skilled at doing cosmetic dentistry and implants. Has anybody ever had an implant? They're like 10 grand a pop, okay? That's nice work, right? The problem is he didn't know how to attract the clients who could pay that. He was attracting the, the patients who could pay for a $69 teeth cleaning and then he'd never see them again. So he said, help me with that. So before he met me, he was getting maybe one implant a month after going through the process that I'm going to explain to you today. I'm gonna to give you three steps of nine, because I don't have all day to give you all nine. Um, after that, uh, the first two months of this year, he did four and a half a month. He went from less than one a month to nine in two months. So, that is just what this process does, helping to narrow down and understand some things, some basics about this business. So first of all, I'm gonna qualify myself a little bit more. James did a great job, but just to tell you a little bit more about myself and why I should be standing up here and talking to you about this stuff today. Um, this is kind of my on paper resume, but besides that, I spent a career selling marketing support services to really big companies and some very small companies. The main difference that I saw was that the small companies, well, the big companies plan. They don't make a decision without running it by a focus group, without doing market research, without doing competitive analysis, without studying the target market. What do small businesses do? What was that? They jump in. They jump in. They guess. It's guesswork. They're like, well, if Joe, the mechanic down the street's in the yellow pages, and I'm an attorney, I think I should be in there in the yellow pages. Or if every other attorney is in the yellow pages, then I need to be in the yellow pages too. And the fact is, you only need to be in the yellow pages if your target market is going to the yellow pages to find what you offer. And even then, I've got the whole spiel about that, I could spend an hour on. So, um, so that was the big difference. My passion was really taking all of this strategic marketing planning and lessons that the huge multinational corporations that I was working with was using, I wanted to take that to small business owners and teach them how to do it right. So in 2009, the Great Recession gave me that opportunity when I lost my job. Um, great job, best money I ever made. I was selling marketing automation software solutions. My clients were Nestle and Delta and Kaiser. Costco had some really big clients. I was doing very well. Um, made it through three rounds of layoffs and, and finally I was one of the last ones to go exited with a nice severance package, and it gave me the opportunity to start a fortune marketing company. So also in that year, I decided, so I had a severance package, not much else, 
starting a business. I decided to divorce my husband, my dog died, I lost my house. I moved into a 600 square foot apartment and started over. So that's my story. Within 600 square foot apartment, I, I mean, I lost my house. It, just, you know, it was a crazy year. It was a very crazy year. Here I am five years later. Within two years, I was making more money doing this than I ever made in my previous life. This works. That's the bottom line. I followed my own advice and it works. So today I'm here to talk to you about the three foolproof ways um, to attract clients with money. But first I want to lay a little bit of a foundation for you about what marketing is. Because I think we need to kind of all be on the same page about what marketing is before I jump into some of the stuff. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the number one law practice killer. Um, and then I'll summarize and then we'll talk about some advanced marketing training. So let's talk about marketing. I happen to believe that especially as small business owners, we need to be really smart about how we market our businesses. Unfortunately, most of us are not. For some reason, small business owners tend to think that marketing is just a game. It's something that we can guess at. Throw a little money on Facebook ads. Throw a little money on, on social media or on uh, yellow pages. Throw a little money here. Throw a little money there. And before you know it, tens of thousands of dollars are wasted and you haven't gotten where you need to be. So the whole strategy behind marketing is really developing a strategy. It's about doing your homework first. How many of you, before you started your law practice, by a show of hands, how many of you did some market research? How many of you talked to other attorneys or talked to the people that you're going to be serving and asked about their, their experience with attorneys, whether they need? Did anybody in the room do that? A few people. Does anybody think that that might have been a little important? I mean, I know you all went to law school, you're really smart, you know, you're really good at what you do, but does anybody think that for where you are and what you want to serve, that might have been important? So those are the types of things, it's not too late, that's the good news, it's not too late. Um, but those are some of the things that, again, I, the, the kind of thinking, it's about thinking about your business in new ways, and that's kind of what I bring to the table and what these three steps that I'm about to share with you are also going to bring to the table. I guarantee by the time we're done today, you're going to think about your businesses, your law practices in a very different way, and it's going to be good. So. Let's talk about the primary purpose of marketing. Why do we need to market our businesses to begin with? And it may not be what you think. Yeah, we need people to know who we are. We need to, you know, communicate it, you know, better than the 50 million other attorneys out there. You know, there's all of that stuff that people think about when they think about marketing. But what really is the primary purpose of marketing? There's a guy named John Chance, who is the founder of Duct Tape Marketing which I think is a pretty brilliant small business marketing system, and my business is very much um, based on that premise, only I've taken it a few steps further and, and made some changes that fit my target market. But the primary purpose, according to him, is about setting expectations. Every single thing we do in our business is marketing especially as an attorney, especially as a solo practice, or even a, you know, not so much a solo practice, you are face-to-face -face with your clients on a regular basis. Everything you do is marketing. From how you dress, to how you shake a hand, to how your staff answers the phone, to what your office looks like when they walk in, to what the bathroom looks like, it all sets an expectation about you. Especially for you guys. And I can relate to this. You're not charging 10 bucks an hour, right? Your bathroom can't look like a gas station bathroom, okay? What kind of message does that send? If you're gonna charge, what, 300 bucks an hour, 400, 500 bucks an hour, you need to look like you're worth it in everything you do. From the car you drive, even if you're not driving the $120,000 Benz, at least making sure it's clean, you know, think just little things like that. We, especially because of what we do, we need to sell success. So it's about setting that expectation. We want to make sure we're setting an expectation that is neither too high nor too low. If we're setting an expectation too high, what are we doing? 
If we're, if we're promising the world but we can only deliver California, <laughs> we are letting people down. And what is that? Especially again in our industry where the trust hurdle, I'm a consultant, you know, consultants, we're not exactly the most trusted people in the world either. You know, we charge a ton of money and we don't do anything. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. yeah. So we, got it. we have to overcome that trust hurdle and it's about setting expectations. It's about making sure that every time we say something, we're at least meeting that expectation. Because if we're promising the world and only delivering California, in essence, we're lying. It creates a, a uh, it, it creates mistrust, right? The last thing we need in our industries is for people to think that we're lying. It just feeds the frenzy, right? So it's about setting expectations, making sure every single time anybody comes in contact with you, you are meeting or exceeding expectations. On the other side, conversely, we, know, we don't also don't want to set an expectation that's too low. <laughs> if we're promising California and delivering the world, what are we doing? Underselling. Underselling and what else? Anybody? We're leaving money on the table. How many people like leaving money on the table? One of the first things I did, I do with my clients, and one in particular, of course, nutritionist. She was fun and she's doing very well. Um, one of the first things I made her do was raise her prices. She's PhD at UC Davis, she wasn't charging enough. So I said, you raise your prices, like, I think I said 40%, and we negotiated down to 25. Her first sale, she went out with this 25% increase in her rates, and she's like, all nervous and everything. They said, fine, I'll take it. She's like, damn it, I should have gone 40%. <laughs> right? We undervalue ourselves. So we need to make sure that we're setting expectations that are neither too high nor too low. So, I already said this. So what is marketing? So marketing is about setting expectations. But what is marketing? I'm gonna give you a definition today, for those of you who've heard me speak too many times in the last couple months. I'm gonna give you a not so new definition today about marketing. This is another John Jans duct tape marketing um, meeting, meaning. and five years ago when I started, it was kinda of new, everybody's using it now. It For me, this breaks marketing down to its very simplest Form, and it really, really makes sense, especially for us small business owners, okay? Marketing is oftentimes this pie-in-the-sky, crunchy granola, esoterical, wishy-washy thing, and I don't understand why. Our taxes, we don't guess at our taxes, do we? Some of us do, but that's another story. Extension. Um, so, you know, I mean, we don't guess at we don't guess at employment law, or we shouldn't be, right? We don't guess at, you know, the brick and mortars don't guess at inventory, or at least they shouldn't be. There are so many processes and systems in our business that we don't guess at. Yet, for some reason, the most important thing people think is a guessing game. So, and I wonder why, when you have, this is like out of an MBA, you know, textbook, classic textbook. When we have definitions like this, who can relate to this? Nobody, right? So I have a new definition that's gonna make more sense, and it's really simple, it's gonna change your life, I promise, forever. I just want this to be your new mantra. This is all we're trying to do with our marketing. Very simply, we are trying to get complete strangers, we're trying to get people who have a need to know, like, and trust us. We are very simply trying to get people who have a need to know, like, and trust us so that when they're ready to buy, they buy from us. Right? Simple. We're trying to get complete strangers to give us their money. Right? Because we're better than everybody else and we say we're better than everybody else and everybody else is saying they're better than everybody else. So how do we stand apart? How do we stand out in the crowd? And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. The three steps now that I'm going to talk to you about are what are going to help you stand apart from the crowd. Now the beauty of no like, and trust is if you're Nestle, if you're Kaiser, if you're Budweiser, you can kind of pay for some of that, right? Anything can be bought, right? So if you've got enough money, you can buy no like, and trust. Right? Consistency builds trust. 
if you, and I have a story about, you know, when I, so I shared with you that I went through a divorce a few years ago. I had a lot of long, lonely, crazy, you know, not crazy, long, lonely nights on the couch watching late night TV. The infomercials. And as a marketer, I love this stuff. It's like, you know, I just look at it. I'm like, how does this work? How does it work? Um, so one night, you know, or a couple nights, I'm flipping through and I see this infomercial. I'm like, that is the stupidest thing ever. Who falls for this? This is ridiculous. So, you know, I see it on night four, night, night five, night six. And, you know, here we are maybe a year later and I'm on the couch one late night again. And I see the commercial again. I'm like, wow, okay, I might need one of those. Brainwashed, right? If you see something enough, you start believing it, right? It's just consistency. And that's what Nestle and Kaiser and Budweiser know with their billion dollar marketing budgets. You can buy, know, like, and trust. Who here has a million dollar marketing budget? Anybody come? <laughs> Nobody. That means we need to be smart. We don't have money, so we just need to be smart. We have some money, but we need to be smart. So we can't buy no like and trust, so that just means we need to use our brains. So maybe by now you're starting, this is all starting to make a little sense. And starting to maybe understand why I need to delay this foundation about what marketing really is before I get into the how. Okay? And I'm actually only going to touch on the three hows today. Like I said, there are nine. And I'm going to talk at the end about a, a boot camp that I do that actually talks about all nine and the nine steps that I, I my one on one clients go through and everything. So I'm just giving you a tip of the iceberg today. But it's actually enough. If you take just one thing that you learn today from any of these, I guarantee your business is going to change. So, three foolproof strategies to attract clients with money. Number one, setting goals. You've all heard that. It's nothing new, right? We need to set goals, blah, blah, blah. I'm the worst person ever at setting goals, by the way. But I have found when I do, it works. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about that. Number two, identify a real, real, real target market. You all think you have a target market? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Number three, crush the competition. Okay. So those are the three elements I'm going to spend the next four hours talking to. <laughs> Sorry. Once I get started, you know I can't stop. So number one, setting goals. It's really important. You've all heard this. You know, this is nothing new. The, the, the thing is, you know, we know we need to do it, but do we do it? Not necessarily. So setting goals, of course, especially in marketing, is key. Because if we don't have a goal, we're shooting at a moving target. Okay? And I, like I said, I, I don't like writing down my goals, and I don't like all that. You know, it's like, no, it's, I can't be bothered with all that. But when I worked with a coach early on who made me do it, lo and behold, it worked. Oh my gosh, all of a sudden stuff was happening and I was following plans and it worked. And the same is true with my clients. But number one, we need to sit down and figure out what is your vision for your practice? We get so caught up in the day-to-day -day of our businesses, the networking and the meetings and the staff issues and the this and the taxes and that that we kind of forget why we went into this in the first place. Why did we decide to become an attorney? Who did we want to help? What is that vision? Write that down so that you remember why you're doing this. We're not working in the beginning. You know, I worked, I worked what, 60, 70 hours a week in the day. I worked a lot. And most people do when they first start a business. I didn't do that because I, well, I did enjoy it, but I didn't do it for my health. I did it because I had an agenda. So, and that agenda was I wanted to help small businesses. So what is your agenda? Okay. And um, what kind of attorney do you want to be? What do you want to be known for? John Jans tells a great story in his speeches about, and kind of jumping ahead a little bit into difference, differentiation. But he tells a story about an attorney who decided he wanted to be, how many of you heard, oh God, attorneys never call us back. Anybody ever heard that before? They're notorious, right, for not returning phone calls or not calling me back. Well, there, he tells a story about an attorney that he worked with who happened to uh, make his difference the attorney that calls you back within an hour. He was a hugely successful practice on that one element. What did he want to be known for? He wanted to be known for the one in a million attorney who actually called you back. And he did it. So what do you want to be known for? What is it? You know? Think about that. Do you want to be the one who gets results? 
Do you want to be the one that holds hands? Do you want to be the one that is the trusted advisor that your client go comes to no matter what the problem is? What is that that you want to be? And hold on to that. That is your vision, and that should be part of your goal. What are your personal goals? The nice thing about being business owners is that our business supports us and feeds us and pays our bills and sends us on vacations and you know gives us those cars we want to drive and all that fun stuff. So what are those goals? And then what are your business goals and what are your one and your three and your five year plans? So it's really important to outline all of this and use this as a foundation and a guide for everything that you do in your business. It's a heck of a lot easier to market your business. And I love numbers, that's why I'm a geek. I always say I'm the marketing geek. I love the numbers and the analysis and the number crunching and all of that, that's what I do. Um, but it's a lot easier to market your business if you understand that in order to live the lifestyle I wanna live, I need a $10 million practice. Whatever my piece of that is, is whatever it is, but the staff I need and everything else that I need, I need a $10 million practice. Well, how many clients is that on an annual basis? How many existing retainer clients is that? And how many new clients is that? And then you see how you can kind of start working backwards. Well, if I need 100 new clients a year to get there and I need to retain 50%, well, then all of a sudden you start putting processes and systems in place to help you do that. And all of a sudden, guess what? It's not a guessing game. It's science. It's numbers. It's fun. Really. All right, so that's setting goals. Your number two tactic to help attract clients with more money is probably one of, well, the second most important. Um, the, next, the third one's also important. But defining a target market. Why is a target market so important? And why do us marketing types talk about it constantly until your ears clean? Because it's freaking important, <laughs> all right? If you are not defining a target market, you're out there blasting to anybody and everybody. Imagine, so when I first started Fortune Marketing Company, I naively would go out and say, hey, I'm gonna help you find a target market, and people would run in the opposite direction. Why? Because it's scared. Well, you're telling me, if I can only focus on a target market, there's 90% of the population I can't do business with. I'm not saying you can't do business with them. I'm saying there's probably no chance they're ever gonna do business with you. Probably not. The numbers and the data back that up for me. And the ones who do do business with you in that 90%, you regret every second of every day that you wake up, right? So it's about finding the people we work best with. <laughs> I don't know, I lost it. Um, so defining a target market, we're, oh, so the, the bottom line is, if you don't define a target market and you go out and just hope and pray that everybody and anybody is going to do business with you, what are you doing? Wasting tons of time and money and energy and resources on all the wrong people. So what is your ideal customer? I gave you your, what? What is your ideal client? Would any of you like these clients? Any divorce attorneys? Elizabeth Taylor? She would have been a fun one, right? Or how about old Justin Bieber? Any criminal attorneys in the room? Yeah, he's getting himself into good trouble lately, huh? He'd be fun client, right? Lots of money. And how about uh, Microsoft versus Apple? Any intellectual property patent attorneys in the room? Wouldn't they be a good client? And how about Walmart? HR, Mr. James. Um, and you know, constantly getting sued by their employees, right? So these would be ideal clients, right? These might be your ideal client, but we live in the real world, okay? The Walmarts and the Justin Biebers, thank God, don't come along every day, right? So we need to figure out who our Justin Bieber is and who our Walmart is. And we figure out who our ideal client is by just kind of doing a little bit of work, kind of thinking about it. Who respects our business? Think about your ideal client that I made you that I made you think about when we first started. They respect your business. They're profitable, and especially for those who um, work hourly and you're on an hourly retainer, right? You want to make sure that your best client is not necessarily the person who pays you the most, right?
right? The person who pays you the most, <coughs> sometimes depending on how good you are at actually charging them by the hour, and if you're actually getting what you're worth every hour, the person who pays the most but calls you in the middle of the night or calls you on weekends or harasses your staff or whatever, that may not be your best client. What we want instead of the, the one who spends the most are the ones who are most profitable. Look at your profit margins on each and every one of the clients and make sure your, your target market are the most profitable. And they refer others. How many here love referrals? Right? Easy. They already trust you. That whole trust hurdle. We don't have to jump through hoops. Okay? So this is what our ideal client looks like. So what do we look for? Well, we want to look at demographics. You know, how old are they? Are they married? Where did they go to school? Um, do they have children? You know, things like that. Where do they live? What size house do they live in? How much do they make? What do they do for a living? It's really important to know all that. So one of the things I want you all to do tomorrow, or whenever you have time, preferably soon before you forget, is to go back and think about your 10 best clients. Maybe past clients, maybe existing clients. Write them all, open up a spreadsheet, put them all, put about 10 in the left-hand column. Across the top, I want you to list every single attribute that you can think of about your client. Their age, their gender, their political party, if you know it, their hobbies, how many kids they have, where they went to school, what they drive, do they work out, do they eat healthy, do they do yoga, do they like horses, do they like golf, do they go on vacation in Italy, everything that you can think about. The interesting thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna start seeing patterns. My dentist, who would have known? Three out of five of the people I interviewed were master gardeners. Really? So guess what? We can hit up the UC Davis Master Gardener program and do some advertising there. There might be more. So it's real everything that you can think about, okay? And so you want to look at de demographics. You want to look at psychographics. What do they value? What are they moral? So what are their morals? Are they religious? Do they go to church? What church do they go to? What keeps them up at night? Are they worried about their kids' college education? Are they worried about retirement? Are they worried about whether or not they're going to be able to sail around the world? What are those things that are important to them? And then, of course, geographics, because I think everybody here probably pretty much needs to work within California, so that might be important. And then their behaviors. Okay? So these are the things that we need to look for when we are um, defining our target market. All right? So create that spreadsheet. Look for patterns. Once you identify those, Write a paragraph as if that person is sitting across the table from you, like it's your BFF, okay? And then, armed with that description, go out to the world and find more just like them. Because guess what? If they bought from you, there's a reason you click. People like them will also buy from you, okay? All right, now number three, crush your competition. I kind of thought when I was kind of tweaking this presentation for you guys that attorneys might be a little competitive. Am I wrong there? <laughs> Are attorneys generally kind of kind of competitive? Yeah. A little bit? Um, I can relate to that. I was never really, as a salesperson for 17 years, I wasn't competitive. I had five minutes. <coughs> um, but since I started my own business, I have become really competitive, so I can definitely relate to this. So this is about crushing. Let's crush the competition. Let's kill it. <laughs> you know, we want to crush the competition. And there are, the thing is though, there's not competition. Kind of, a, it's, it's a weird thing. So, you know, there might be other HR attorneys out there. There might be other um, succession planning attorneys out there. There might be other divorce attorneys out there. But the fact is, because it's you, you bring something completely different and unique to the table. So you're, the, but your job is to figure out what that is. It's not that you've been in business seven years, nobody cares. There's a guy down the street who's been in business eight. It's not that you're full service because nobody's half service. It's your job to figure out why you're different and communicate that effectively, okay? So the bottom line is, and I talked about this before, if you're not figuring out how you are different, you're leaving money on the table because you're commoditizing yourself. You have become just another attorney in the yellow pages that people thumb through and pick up the phone and say what? Anybody? When you get a call from the yellow pages, what's usually one of the first questions they ask? What do you charge? How much? How much or a free consultation, right? How many people love those calls? That's your dream client, right? No. Like five, no. 
So but if we know that, and if we know who our, our, how, what our core difference is, and we start attracting the right people, then we can you know, spend due time with those friendly people who call us from the yellow pages, put in the back of our mind to know that it's probably not our idea. So finding your core difference, ask your employees, ask your best clients, and again, in boot camp, I go into this in great detail. I don't have time today. Um, there are some questions that you can ask. Um, you know, you want to interview your best clients, and you want to find out from them, why am I different? Why did you choose me? Why do you stay with me? And why do you refer me? They're going to tell you, okay? And that's going to give you gold. That's marketing gold. One of the things I do for my clients are client interviews. It's marketing gold. I get from the mouths of the people who hire them why they're the best and why they're different. So once you figure all that out, then, you, you, uh, then it's time to communicate it. And there are three main messages, a core marketing message, a talking logo, and a marketing purpose statement. Um, the core marketing message sometimes is, can be referred to almost like a tagline. So make sure your tagline um, describes what you do. Your talking logo is kind of your elevator pitch. It's not, I'm an attorney. It's, I help people get out of sticky situations or whatever it is, but get creative. And your marketing purpose statement is kind of your vision statement, only with a marketing twist. Okay. All right. I am out of time. I talk too much. So I'm just going to not talk about tools today. So the number one reason, though, I practiced, I, I promised you, for um, law practices and businesses failing in general, the number one reason businesses fail, hands down, is because they guess. They guess. They throw money in the toilet on bad decisions because they guess. They don't make educated decisions about their marketing. But with just the three steps that I gave you today, you can stop guessing. You can at least put some educated, some education behind it, and at least start making educated guesses, right? Educated guesses are better than blind guessing, right? So that is, marketing isn't a guessing game, okay? Marketing is about testing, tracking, and measuring. We need to make sure every marketing tactic we do is being tested, tracked, and measured. And again, I'd be more than happy to tell you how to do that, but I can't do that today. I don't want to keep doing that. So in conclusion, at the beginning, I told you I was going to give you a new idea and a new foundation for marketing, which I did. Give you a new definition, getting complete strangers to know, like, and trust you so that when they're ready to buy, they buy from you. Sorry. And then I said I was going to give you three foolproof strategies to attract clients with money. Number one is planning. Number two is finding a target market. And number three is to differentiate. And then whatever you do, track it. And if it's not working, stop it. <laughs> stop. Yellow pages. If it's not working, just stop spending $5,000 a month on it. Or whatever it is these days. All right. All right. So um, today I wanted to, I, I talked to you, you know, I'm sorry, I actually thought I had more time today, so I apologize for rushing through it so much. Um, there really is a nine-step program that a uh, few people in here have, have been to. It's my boot camp. I'm doing my next one on May 1st, and it is from 9 to 1230 in downtown Walnut Creek. Um, and it's going to give you all nine steps. I'm going to teach you how to do a lot of the stuff I talked about today in depth, okay? And it's normally 99 but because James is a good friend of mine, I'm offering it to all of you today for just $29. The, ca the catch is that you need to register today to get that $29 um, rate. So I'm handing out, they handed out a feedback form. I would appreciate it if you would fill that out. There's some free stuff on there for you. Um, you can also register for the boot camp, but you can get a copy of today's slides if you'd like, and you can get a free report and I think some other stuff on there. So take a look, and I would appreciate your feedback. And can I take just a couple questions if anybody has them real quickly? Are you able to stick around afterwards for the networking for sure. Sure. Okay. That's sure, I can do that. All right. All right. Thank you all very much for listening. Yeah. I
no, really, it is well worth it. Um, so we are uh, happy to have as well today Allison Buchanan. She will speak. Uh, well, Allison is a shareholder in the firm in Oakland Jones and Hemphill uh, Silicon Valley office, and she focuses her practice on business litigation, professional liability, professional malpractice, and legal ethics. She also has experience in employment and real estate litigation. She's also currently serving a three-year appointment to the State Bar's Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct. So we will chat. She teaches professional responsibility at Lincoln Law School in San Jose and is also a member of the Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers. So she's here to present to us and also give us a one-hour at the MCLE credit. So, uh, so with that, I'll begin. Website. How many of you 
have a firm website. So almost every one of you. Uh, that's certainly you know a, a newer phenomenon uh, in the last 10 years that went from being a, a new and unusual thing to being pretty standard. Um, how many of you have looked at, well, how many of you have a disclaimer with your firm website? How many of you don't know? For those of you who said that you do have a disclaimer, when's the last time you looked at it? Anyone look at it in the last year? Okay, so <laughs> you're gonna be the star pupil up here. <laughs> um, okay, so what are the issues that arise when we receive information from a potential client through our firm website? There are two main issues that I can think of. One is confidentiality and the other is competence. And what it really relates to is accidentally becoming somebody's lawyer. You never want to accidentally become somebody's lawyer. That's never going to inure to your benefit. Um, so it's usually like a statute got blown and then the, the client says, oh, but you were representing me and I expected you to file, right? It's never like, I have this bucket of cash I want to send you, you're my lawyer. Um, the other way that it comes up is conflicts. Um, inadvertently forming an attorney-client relationship with somebody because you accepted confidential from information from them through your website, and then you're conflicted out from representing the real client who you want to rep and who wants to you to represent them, and who does have a bucket of cash to give you. So be really careful. Check your disclaimers with your website and make sure that you're not letting people just send you confidential information without explaining to them. Uh, that you're not their lawyer, you don't represent them, sending information doesn't create a relationship, uh, and that they can't form that relationship unilaterally. Yes? Should we hold questions till the end, or are you okay taking them as you go? I'm fine taking them as we go. Um, I was late and I apologize, so I think we're under a little bit of a time pressure, um, but I think we have we have plenty of time, so if you have a question. Yeah, just real quick. Yeah. You know, our, our website has a form a client can click on, enter their email address, and type in a brief message. Yeah. Do we have an ethical obligation to respond every single time a client does that? That's it. Well, a potential client, I mean. A do, potential client. Even if it's, no, I can't help you, does it create some sort of expectation on their side? Oh, I've emailed an attorney. That's my attorney. Right. Is, is that something that the ethical committee or the, the, the bar court would view as setting up a relationship? There's no opinion directly on that, but what I would say is your disclaimer can address that, right? Your disclaimer can say, and and depending on how your site is built, and this is somebody you should talk to, your host or your IT person, um, but normally, not normally, the better disclaimers, the disclaimers that I like, are the ones where you have to read it and click I accept before the potential client can move to the next page and enter the information and send it. But you can include in your disclaimer that sending this information should not create um, the expectation of an attorney-client relationship. We may or may not get back to you. I mean, liken it to email, right? How many of you have gotten an email from somebody in um, you know, Japan, who, the, the, the famous one, right, is that guy in Japan who has a, a big um, deposit that he wants to give you, and, uh, you know, you're not going to respond to that email, right, and I don't think anybody would expect you to or would think that you departed from a standard of care by, by not responding. So I would just include that in your disclaimer, um, but make sure your disclaimer is good. Um, you know, appoint somebody in your office. Um, to look at that every once in a while. Um, let me give you uh, just a, I give you a couple of examples here. <coughs> the Coprac opinion 2005-168 has to do with visitors to a website submitting confidential information. Um, and this Barton versus U.S. District Court case is really interesting. It had to do with people who submitted questionnaires through a firm website and whether those questionnaires 
were privileged uh, later when the firm decided not to represent those folks. So those are a couple of um, resources for you if this, in if this issue concerns you. But you certainly, you know, you, you want to intentionally form relationships with clients. You never want to accidentally. Um, and there's a case in California um, called Butler where if somebody thinks, if you think somebody might mistakenly think you're their lawyer, uh, I heard someone at the, uh, the State Bar Ethics Symposium this weekend use it as a verb, you have to butlerize them. You need to explain to them, you need to say, hey, it's sort of like the stop sign rule under 3600, I'm not your lawyer, I don't represent you. And you have to speak up uh, to make sure that that person understands. Okay, so tip number two. Your website and social media may constitute communication. <laughs> so this tip really has to do with 1-400, which is our advertising rule. This main sentence, your website and social media may constitute communication, is going to come up about three different times in this program um, because it, it draws up several different issues. So for this one, we're just going to talk about straight up advertising and our board of trustees standards. Um, I find that a lot of people are generally familiar with 1-400. It's not that complicated. You can't lie. You can't mislead, right? I find that a lot of people Sort of forget that attached to 1400, we have a whole set of Board of Trustees standards and their presumptive violations of 1400. Um, so people tend to read the rule and not go to the comments, uh, which I find a little bit scary. And as a risk manager for my law firm, you know, anytime people are reading something that I think they should be reading, I get very nervous. So, um, so you know, one of the issues with the standards. One of the main issues is guarantees or warranties, right? Creating expectations with clients or potential clients. Um, and when you have a warranty or a guarantee, it's a presumptive violation unless you've got a disclaimer. Um, and we're going to talk about different sites and the issues that those specific sites raise in a little bit. Um, but let me direct your attention to the, the third co-crack opinion, 2012-186. This is one of the newest formal opinions by co uh, How many of you are familiar with it? How many of you even knew that it existed? <laughs> okay, so this is actually, I think, a really cool opinion because it gives us some practical answers to questions about posting on social media. Uh, it gives us five example statements, and then it tells us that's a communication subject to 1400, or that's not a communication subject to 1400. Uh, so it's a nice guideline if you're wondering whether something, some communication that you're about to undertake constitutes a communication. Let me um, walk you through those five examples really quickly. I won't. Uh, you know, read you the whole five-page opinion, but the first example, these are all <coughs> on a, a page that is described to obviously be a Facebook page, but I don't think they actually say it because you know, one of the issues is we try to avoid discussing specific technology in these opinions because it changes so rapidly. Uh, when they first started doing opinions on social media and technology back in 2001, um, you know, we have the one from 2005, you know, what would have been the technology that would have been referenced in 2005? MySpace. What good would an opinion about MySpace do today? None. It wouldn't be transferable to anything. It wouldn't, it would be totally obsolete. So we try to avoid talking about specific technologies and instead talk about things in more looser terms, but this is clearly a Facebook uh, example. So the first example is <coughs> case finally over, unanimous verdict, celebrating tonight. Raise your hand if you think that's a communication subject to 1400. Raise your hand if you don't think it's a communication subject to 1400. 
So two of you have an opinion on this, <laughs> three of you. Um, this is not, the committee determined that this is not a communication subject to one board member. Okay, let's do the next one. Another great victory in court today. My client is delighted. Who wants to be next? Raise your hand if you think that is not a communication subject to one board member. Raise your hand if you think it is a communication subject to one board member. Okay, so what the committee decided was that because of that, third sentence, who wants to be next? It has to do with the availability for professional employment, and it does constitute a communication subject to 1400. You look befuddled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so check out the opinion. It's, I mean, it's really interesting. Um, or, you know, I think it's interesting, but you guys know what my interests and hobbies are, so. Um, <laughs> one million dollar verdict. Tell your friends and check out my website. Communication? Yes, yeah. that's an easy one. You're like, yes, now I'm in. Um, now I'll raise my hand and vote. Um, what another personal injury case? Call me for a free consultation. Yes, yes. Um, and it's specifically because of that call me for a free consultation that the committee thought that would go right into that communications category. Okay, last one. Just published an article on wage and hour breaks. Let me know if you'd like a copy. Yes? No. That's right, it's no. It's under the Bell Life case. Uh, so those sorts of communications don't constitute um, communications. I have to be careful how we use the phrase communications for purposes of 1400. So what are my, my practice pointers for, for this tip? Um, confirm that your communications are truthful and not misleading. Avoid appearing to guarantee your warrant. Um, include disclosure, disclosure language or disclaimer language. And you know, I'll tell you, um, Sites like, let's just pick on LinkedIn for a second. And I, I use LinkedIn and I like LinkedIn, uh, but just as an example, uh, LinkedIn allows you to have people uh, post recommendations about your services, right? Somebody tell me where on your LinkedIn page there's a space for you to put in a disclaimer. Put it have people that do not those little box recommendations with people that actually endorse you. Mm -hmm. I have them include a disclaimer in the endorsement. That's really smart. Um, but your your own site or your own so say we agree, say we agree that that LinkedIn page is a communication. Where can you disclaim that it doesn't? constitute a guarantee or a warranty of any specific outcome. It doesn't have a spot for it. Um, so I put it under hobbies. <laughs> I put it in sort of the box closest to where those recommendations would show up. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's sort of a generally agreed amongst people who fret about these types of things uh, that you should have one of those disclaimers on a LinkedIn page if it includes a recommendation from a client or a former client. Um, but I'll say overall, with respect to my whole talk tonight, I don't think that the, bo the bar spends um, most of its resources or time going after people for straight up ethics violations. And this is probably where it's really, or uh, advertising violations, really important for me to say, you know, I'm here as an individual, not as a member of COPRAC. I think, I don't think the bar Really, really cares that much about advertising as a standalone violation. I think what happens, and this is just from my own personal observation, somebody gets in trouble for something else, and then they look at the lawyer's advertising. So an example would be the mortgage fraud uh, from 2009, 2010, when the bar started busting these, um, I, hate, I hesitate to even call them firms. Um, and, but one of the things that the bar did was with, the bar would send a letter to these lawyers and say, we're investigating you and we want this and we want this and we want this. And you know what else we want? You're advertising for the last two years. And the rules require you to retain any advertising, any communication or solicitation for a certain number of years. And what they <coughs> wanted to evaluate was whether the, these lawyers were falsely advertising such that people were inclined to let them try to restructure their mortgage. 
so that's, I think that's where it comes up more. So if you don't have a disclaimer on your LinkedIn site, you know, I'm not gonna, I, don't, I haven't gone through all of the LinkedIn pages for all of the lawyers in my office and hassled them about it, you know. Uh, but I have one because I think you should do as you say not. <laughs> the question is what is the content that fits that because what you've got is people saying, hey, he's a good guy, I like it. Yeah. And how do you disclaim with respect to that? This is no guarantee yeah. that you will be satisfied with my services. Or? So the wonderful thing about these Board of Governors or Board of Trustees standards is they actually give you sample language. Um, and so it, I think that it's sufficient to say something to the effect of this page shall not constitute a warranty, guarantee, or prediction of any outcome. I think, I think that's sufficient. So that's a good question. I have four of these, and for people with good questions, I'm gonna give them out. They're little mini sets of the rules of professional conduct, and they also include pieces of the State Bar Act. Um, they're really helpful. Uh, they're also free, so if you don't get one tonight, you can go to the State Bar's office, or you can call them and ask them to mail them to you. I called and asked for 40 because I wanted one on every desk of every lawyer at my firm so that when they called me with an ethics question, I could say, well, why did you turn to page 22? And let's look at it together. I'm gonna teach a man to fish, um, right? Um, I would call it a mini publication 250. So there's a, a publication 250 that they sell for like 12 bucks. And it's an eight by 11 booklet, it's probably a half inch thick. Um, and this is sort of an annotated, tiny font version of that. Uh, and they're updating them constantly, so I think this might be like the, the second to last version. It might still say Board of Governors instead of Board of Trustees, but if you wait long enough, they'll change it back, so. Um, okay, so let's go to uh, tip number three. Online chats could create a duty or obligation. So this really has to do with people hanging out in chat rooms, um, talking to um, potential clients. Uh, there's a co-prac opinion about hanging out in a chat room, talking to victims of a, a mass disaster, trying to get them to sign you up as their lawyer. Um, so the rule implicated, again, is competence, confidentiality. We could possibly have an accidental formation of an attorney-client relationship. We could also possibly have um, unauthorized practice of law, multi-jurisdictional practice issues. Um, so <laughs> my practice pointer on this issue is to just err on the side of caution if you're inclined to participate. I don't think, I don't think chat rooms are as big as they were several years ago. I think where it's coming up now is like on Avo, where you can answer a question and then you get into this sort of back and forth with the person who asked the question. And I, I would say that those are pretty um, similar. Um, so always remind and restate that you're you're not let you may not be licensed where this person is, uh, that you're not their lawyer, um, that you're not they shouldn't expect anything to be confidential. Just setting those expectations. Okay, so tip four has to do with those rating sites and those directory sites. Um, and and I, I am on LinkedIn and I'm on Avo. Um, I am not one of those folks who says, um, well, there are issues, so I'm just going to not use them. Um, I think that that is um, a perfectly reasonable approach, and there are plenty of folks that I respect and admire who just have said, you know, the ethical issues are a little bit too um, iffy, and I'm not, I'm not in. It's not worth it to me. Maybe it doesn't lend itself to my practice anyway, for whatever reason. Um, so LinkedIn, you go to LinkedIn and you make your own profile, right? How many of you know what Avo is? So sometimes I give this talk, and most of the room doesn't know what Avo is. You guys are a sophisticated crowd. Um, but I find that Avo is sort of um, one of the most interesting issues for this conversation that we're having tonight. Um, because Avo exists whether you want it to exist or not. Um, everybody has an Avo profile, even if you've never set 
foot on the site. Um, so they, they go to the State Bar website and they mine it for data about every California lawyer. They create a profile based on the information that they're able to gather and there's your profile with your rating. But great news, you can adopt your profile. You can correct any misinformation. You can add information uh, and that causes your rating to increase. Um, so what's the problem? Well, you can't ever unadopt your AVO profile. You can't, once you've adopted it, you can't, it's, it's there. It, it was already there, but now you've endorsed what's there. So clients, former clients, opposing counsel. How many of you think an opposing counsel and I like to say something negative about you online that they really, really could? Um, so hopefully none of you. Hopefully you all have lovely relationships all of your opponents. Uh, but, you know, AVO is difficult because you can't always, you don't have control over everything on your page. Uh, the other concern with AVO is that people abuse it. Uh, they put things that they know will increase their rating in order to have a higher rating, but maybe those, those entries aren't true. Maybe they're technically true, but not really related to the practice of law. And then we get into this whole sort of philosophical conversation about, you know, well, maybe my potential clients really do care that I coach T-ball. Maybe that's important to them, that, I, that family is important to me, and that I'm a real human instead of, um, you know, just a suit. So there are all of these issues that are implicated. 1-400, obviously, is our advertising rule. Um, and then we've got some additional authority that's um, you know, fairly helpful, but it's uh, from all over. So we have this, um, <laughs> this LA County Bar Association from 2012, Connecticut, South Carolina, um, and then the Peel case obviously doesn't have to do with uh, AVO, uh, but it does have to do with this constitutional issue about whether you can call yourself a specialist or an expert. So this gentleman over in the corner mentioned earlier that you let people, that you, you like giving people endorse you on LinkedIn. Um, and do you remember what the phrase that they use is? I, Skills I, and expertise. I, I don't remember exactly, <laughs> but it's basically one that says that uh, this doesn't guarantee a similar right. result. Right, like but the, the heading that LinkedIn said what it shows up as is skills and expertise. There are states where calling yourself an expert is just as prohibited as in California calling yourself a certified specialist. Um, so the problem is you can't change LinkedIn's head, right? So what do you do? You just not use it? Um, in California, you can call yourself an expert. The, I'll tell you it has the implications if you ever get sued for malpractice because then you're held to a higher standard of care. So I like to say that I you know, focus my practice on a certain area. I'm not an expert uh, in anything. Other people are willing to take that, uh, that risk. Okay. Uh, but on that one, is it people <coughs> endorsing you for those skills and expertise? You're not advertising that you have them. Well, you and have you don't control created- it, they show up. You have created that LinkedIn page. You could take it down today if you wanted to. So under 1400, that page, not pieces of it, but that page could be considered an, an advertisement or a communication for purposes of 1400, just like the 2001 Cochrane opinion that says your firm website is an advertisement for purposes or a communication for purposes of 1400. So. Um, you know, it's just something to be aware of. I don't think it's, again, um, and I'll tell you, um, I'm on a listserv for the Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers for April. Uh, and people get into these conversations, these little back and forths about the advertising rules all the time, which I, I do find a little bit hilarious because it's, like I said, not exactly what the bar's chief office of the chief trial counsel is really focusing on. However, um, it's one of the more interesting and sexy things that have come along for us to talk about in a long time. 
Um, <laughs> it's better than you know spending an hour talking about what to do with your client. You think your client might commit perjury. You know that is a good way to put a law school class or a group of practicing lawyers to sleep. So um, unless unless you do this particular practice area for a living, and that's fascinating. But I'm on this listserv and I'm reviewing this conversation. And guess who chimes in in the conversation? Uh, Josh King, the general counsel of ABO. Um, and he apparently you know, paid the $180 to be a member of the Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers so he could wait for just the right moment to pounce in on the listserv conversation and stick out for, he actually was sticking out for LinkedIn. And, um, and you know, he cited um, constitutional issues and you know, First Amendment issues. And the other thing that he raised, and I thought it was really interesting, that you know, um, and mind you, he's the general counsel for ABO. Um, so he said, you know, LinkedIn has 300 million users worldwide. How many of those users do you think are US attorneys? A fraction of 1%. How many of those users do you think are in a state that prohibits the use of the word expert? Because that's the word that's the issue with LinkedIn a fraction of that fraction of 1%. So in their view, this is an extreme edge issue. Uh, and this, again, this is Josh speaking, sort of analyzing it as he would, I think, if he were with LinkedIn. But it's an extreme edge issue. It doesn't relate to most of their users. Um, and they just don't see uh, the need to change it so that a lawyer in Florida, which I think is one of the states where you can't call yourself an expert, uh, feels comfortable using those skills and expertise endorsement. So <laughs> it's, sort of, it's an interesting um, issue. There is also, I'll just point out, an article from, how many of you regularly use the, regularly is kind of a loaded word, but how many of you from time to time will go to the CalBar website and click through the CalBar journal and look at those MCLE self-study articles? Those are a phenomenal resource. Um, what I find them really good for is capturing all of the available authority about a really discrete issue. Um, I know because I've written one before that they're limited to, I think, 4,000 words or something. So they're, they're usually like less than three pages. Uh, and so they do a really good job of editing down to like the, the nugget that you need. There's an article from September 2013 called My Connections Keep Endorsing Me, May I Keep Them. So I'd refer you to that article if this specific issue um, is of interest to you. So with respect to Avo and LinkedIn, what I would say is think, just think about whether the risk benefit is worth it to you. To me, I think it's worth it. I don't think the risk is that high. You do what you can. You put a disclaimer in your in the hobbies box, um, and you go on about your business. Uh, but, but just be thoughtful about it. And if you, hang on one second, if you do decide to adopt your AVO profile, just do the best you can to make sure that everything is accurate. The other thing that Josh said in this listserv conversation was, um, you know, if an attorney contacts us and says this is inaccurate, say for example, a client posted something about, oh, Allison was great in my divorce case. Well, I've never handled a divorce case in my life. So that would be possibly a misleading advertisement. I can call Avo or probably email them and say, hey, there's this endorsement that's actually inaccurate, I've never handled. And, um, and what Josh says is, we'll take it down. So I would say if you decide to use it and you come up against these issues, and then the bar goes after you, so it's like this very you know, decision tree of we're getting to very improbable here, um, in my own personal view, um, to be able to say, and I did take steps to correct the inaccurate information. I contacted Avo. Here's the email where I asked them to take it down. I think that's a great piece of evidence for you to use in your state bar, bar defense case, which, you know, if you get one that's just straight up only advertising, let me know. I mean, I'm so curious to see if they ever do that. Your question. certified 
or have a specialization that is very close to saying you're a certified specialist, and I think that the bar would frown upon that perhaps. So um, you might be getting a little too nuanced, but it's a good question and have a look too. <laughs> okay, so airing your client's dirty laundry online. Um, this is, who does that? That's a great question. Let me tell you about this guy in Virginia called Hunter. This guy Hunter, this lawyer Hunter in Virginia, had a blog. This is a true story. This is a published decision. You can Google um, Hunter versus Virginia State Bar and you'll get the whole thing. Um, was blogging about his clients, like current and the former clients. Um, and he took it all the way up and argued that he had a First Amendment right to do that. He did. He did. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a true story. So obviously we know that it is a horribly stupid, risky, dangerous thing to do. Not to mention that you are violating one of the most basic and fundamental fiduciary duties that you owe your client. Um, all that aside, um, you know, if, if you're going to maintain a blog or if you're going to talk about cases online through Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever, stick to published cases that don't involve your own clients. Um, the only reason, I mean really, the only reason that you would mention your own client is for people to try to show people how awesome you are, that you represent so-and-so, or, I mean, there's no, there's no benefit to your client. There's no benefit to your client in blogging about a current client or even a former client. Um, there's a lot of conversation about whether former clients, um, you know, of course still owe them a duty of confidentiality, but then you get into, you know, what about issues or matters that had nothing to do with the representation. Um, represented, um, you know, Barry Bonds in the steroids case, and then something happened involving his divorce. Couldn't you post an article on Facebook about his divorce? Maybe technically, but why would you? Um, so a lot of these things, you know, um, when, when I first started practicing, um, and particularly in this area, my then supervisor would often categorize things as allowed but stupid. Um, so you know, maybe it's allowed, but it's sure stupid. Um, and you know, Hunter did draw the attention of the state bar, so that's a good example of um, advertising coming to the attention of the state bar. Yes, Steve. Uh, I have a question, Allison. So yeah. if we, not necessarily airing dirty laundry, but is there guidance on whether, like on websites, we can say here, or what can we say here are our representative clients? What would you recommend? My recommendation is to get their permission and sure. to get it in writing. So I'll give you um, a quick anecdote. Um, I was pitching a new client, um, and I wanted to have my marketing department put together a beautiful little thing to bring. So I had my bio, and I had them shrink my photo as small as they could get it, and a bunch of other materials, and they said, you know what would be really nice? Um, is if you had some endorsements from your current clients. Um, and this is not really ethics advice, but um, but I thought, well, how awkward, right? Like, who wants to call their client and say, tell me how, how wonderful I am? Um, <laughs> and Carolyn's saying, yes, do it. So I did it. Um, and I did it in writing so that I would have, have it documented that uh, that I had their permission, and some clients, because of the nature of my practice, you know, I represent lawyers and law firms. I represent judges who have just left private practice, who are sitting on the bench defending uh, a malpractice claim from, from their days of practice. Um, I have clients who want me to be discreet. You know, I wouldn't have clients if I were this hunter guy, um, because they would say, she is a huge blabbermouth. So the clients that I emailed and said, would you mind just giving a couple sentence endorsement for me, or um, you know, I'm doing this pitch, and um, I'm happy to, to not identify you. Um, and I had you know, 
11 different clients who had varying degrees of what they were comfortable with. Um, and it was like the, one of the nicest professional days I've ever had um, because I did this thing that I didn't want to do and I was super embarrassed to do it and my marketing department was like pushing me, pushing me. Um, and I collected 11 really beautiful compliments that are, most of them are now on my bio. They don't have any attribution. Um, and I don't have comments from the people who said, you can use it for this private um, portfolio that you're putting together, together for this client that you're pitching. But I prefer for you to not publicize it either because somebody might be able to figure out you know, what the matter was or, or whatever the issue was. So just get permission. Um, I think that's um, sort of a, just get permission, get it in writing, because I always like to have things in writing a little bit um, picky that way. Um, I'll tell you one other quick anecdote with respect to tip number five. How many of you are familiar um, with U.S. Attorney Jim Lett? Does that name sound familiar? Well, he was the U.S. Attorney in New Orleans. And in December 2012, he had to resign because two of his deputies were posting online about pending ongoing litigation. Pretty sure they lost their jobs too, but poor Jim Letton wasn't doing it. He was just their supervisor. So the takeaway there is we all, under the rules of professional conduct, have a duty to supervise. Not only should you take back these little notes and, and tips that I'm giving you and implement them yourself, but make sure that anybody that works for you is also doing that, especially staff, especially if you have high profile clients or matters. Um, you know, it would be very tempting for an assistant, for example, to say, oh, have the mayor in our office today that you know, talk about divorcing his wife or whatever. Um, but, <laughs> um, but so we want to make sure that we're just reminding our, our employees from time to time about these obligations as well. Um, so I'm going to get a little bit speedy because I think I'm running up on time. So we've talked about a lot of these issues already. Blogs are fertile ground for ethics violations. Um, so you can do it. Uh, I have a couple of tips and thoughts for you. Um, so again, it's that inadvertent guarantee or warranty or predicting an outcome or a result, accidentally providing legal advice, such that you accidentally form an attorney-client relationship, um, violating 1400 by accidentally making a communication, or providing legal advice outside of your jurisdiction. So they're all things that we've sort of talked about before. Uh, Business and Professions Code 6126 is the UP section makes it a misdemeanor so you're not just going to get picked up by the state bar but also by the DA's office. 2012-186 um, is that social media example um, that we did again and then our practice pointers are you know include a disclaimer with your blog um, and you know the way I um, I have a blog that I keep that has nothing to do with the practice of law it's like you know, pictures of my dogs and traveling and I read it and my mom and dad read it. Um, but I know, I understand from that, that there are two different ways you can look at a blog entry, right? You can go to the blog homepage and you can just scroll right through every entry or you can click on a specific entry and there's that one entry. So think about where you're putting your disclaimer because if somebody enters your blog in a way where they're only looking at that one entry, they may never see the disclaimer if you have it in some other format. So you may want to consider putting it at the end of every blog post. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you do blog, keep it separate from your firm website. Have two separate sites because a blog may not constitute a communication. A blog may be more akin to like an article um, under the Bell Eye case, right? So it's, it's tricky um, and we don't have any guidance yet on that. Um, but if you, if you treat it that way, it would be more likely to be found that way. So uh, tip seven, emails are an easy way to breach confidentiality. Admittedly, this is one of the non-marketing tips, but I feel like I can't do a program on technology without mentioning this. Um, you know, so we've got our duties of confidentiality, competence. Um, we've got two duties of confident confidentiality. 
Um, and then this, the 2010 COPAC opinion, the hypothetical in that opinion is lawyer using Wi-Fi at a cafe that they described to send an awful lot like Starbucks, but they never say Starbucks. So my deductive reasoning leads me to believe that that is the example. But um, if somebody can hack into that free Wi-Fi and access your client's confidential information, you have violated your duties of confidentiality and competence. So think about where you're using Wi-Fi. How you're using Wi-Fi is your connection secure. So um, hopefully you have an IT person or somebody you can talk to about those things. I am not that person, I will tell you right now, but we have a great person and when 2010-179 came out, they said, give me the 411 on Wi-Fi and where it's safe and where it's not safe. And this is what she said. Um, airport, you know, what is not safe. Cafe, not secure. Hotel, probably not secure. Um, your own home probably has its own sort of encryption um, situation. So I rarely, uh, if ever, will use uh, a cafe or you know, if I'm traveling for business uh, to transmit confidential information or to access my remote desktop. What I'll do instead is I have a hotspot on my iPhone now, and I'll use that. And it makes my phone get really hot, and it drains the battery. But I'm so much happier with a hot, dead phone than I am with being nervous about using free Wi-Fi. Um, so that's my tip there. Use strong passwords. Um, put two words together that don't have anything to do with each other. Um, use some capital letters and some lowercase letters at symbol, a couple of numbers, and of course don't use the same password for every um, site. Those of you that were impacted by the heart bleed issue last week uh, know that passwords can be extremely annoying, especially if you have to set them. I just have a hard time remembering them, so having a strong password is really difficult because I have a different password for every site and I can never remember what any of them are, so I'm constantly locked out of everything. Um, did, it, did I have a hand over here? Oh, I have two hands. So down in the front row first and then how, do, how, do you, how does the, the uh, COPRAC deal with the, the proposition that, for example, uh, Gmail and uh, Hotmail, all of those are owned by someone else, and so every email that's on them belongs to that person as opposed to uh, the client that they're addressed to, and so carrying on a communication with the client where the client is on one of those sites? Well, your question, sir, assumes facts, not an evidence. Copac has not dealt with that issue. <laughs> um, I would suspect um, that Copac would opine, and again, this is just me sort of guessing, that we do have a reasonable expectation of privacy using Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo. Um, but I, I can't really get, and I certainly can't technically answer that question. I'll tell you there is a later opinion from 2012 that has to do with um, virtual law office or VLO that references some of those issues like cloud computing and using vendors, and that might be a good place to start evaluating that issue. Um, and I include the site for the VLO opinion in a couple of slides. So um, you'll just like um, give me a, a polite hand gesture, James, when I, you want to cut me off. Is that fair? <laughs> okay. We're all good? Okay. Uh, okay, so tip eight, emails and social media are an easy way for your client to waive confidentiality. So this doesn't have to do with you. This has to do with your client, but it does have to do with you. Because your duty of competence requires you to educate your client. Um, let me give you a real life example. This is the 2011 Holmes versus Petrovich case. How many of you are familiar with that case? Okay, that is a Scary, scary case. Let me give you a quick rundown about what happened in Holmes. We have an employment law case. We have a plaintiff. She is still employed at the employer um, who she is suing. Um, and she sits at her desk and she sends emails to her lawyer. And her employer accesses those emails. And she and her lawyer moved to quash, um, moved to suppress those emails. And 
obviously we wouldn't be talking about it if it turned out sort of the way we thought it probably would. Um, but the court said, look, your company, Madam Plaintiff, had a technology policy, and you were informed that you should have no expectation of privacy, that you should not use the device for personal purposes. Um, and it would be akin, this is, this is my favorite quote from the case, it would be akin to going into a conference room in your employer's office and leaving the door open and shouting at your attorney in a very loud voice. Um, so the, the client, I'm sorry, the company was able to access all of her email communications sent while she was sitting at her desk. So what does this mean for you? Um, you need to talk to your clients. Um, depending on who your clients are and the type of law that you practice, um, this may be a conversation. You may need to have a whole conversation with your client. Don't email me when you're at work. Don't email me from your work computer. Don't email me from your work email. Um, wait till you're at home. Wait till you can access your Google account or your Yahoo account. And then you need to take steps that are consistent with that advice. So if you're getting an email from a client in the middle of the day who you may think could have a home situation, uh, you need to say to your client, hey, remember that conversation that we had? Don't email me when you're at work. Did you take today off? Maybe you're sick. Um, or if you get the email from, you know, at employersname.com, you know that your client isn't following your instructions. Um, document that advice to your client as well, right? Because you don't want your client to come back later and say, as a risk manager, I'm all for documenting everything. But um, you don't want your client to come back and say, I didn't understand that that was a risk. Um, I, my lawyer never told me that. So uh, talk to your clients if you had a question. Well, it's more of a, a practice note, really, because when this came, uh, case came out, my firm made it a point to build that into our engagement letter that the client must supply us with a private email address. And so for those that are looking for a way to document it, having an extra couple sentences in the engagement letter is a great place to put it. Yeah, and again, it's, it's very specific to the type of client, the type of matter, um, because you know if I'm communicating with my contact at my corporate client, who's the CEO, well, of course he's going to use his corporate email address, and of course he's going to email me from his desk in the middle of the day. But think about the kinds of clients that you have, and maybe that isn't quite so um, safe. Yes? Well, just to add to that point, um, I put in my retention letter that under attorney client privilege in that section of my retention, that they own that privilege and that they need to be aware that they can inadvertently be waiving that privilege if they are going to email or text me from Starbucks or from an unsecure site, mm -hmm. whether it be a cafe, their work, the airport, and that, yeah. that they have to be very careful because they can certainly waive that privilege. I can't, but they can. Right. Right. That's exactly right. Um, so you want to make sure that you're educating your clients. Hopefully you're also um, having a conversation with them and explaining to them, offering to answer any questions that they have about that. Um, but if you if you represent, for example, employment law plaintiffs, um, knowing about the Holmes case is, is super, super important. Um, okay, tip nine. Email is an easy way to send or receive an inadvertent communication. So it's sort of tacking on to what we're talking about. Um, I actually keep this um, little poster up in my office because I've done it a couple of times and it's super, super <laughs> embarrassing. Um, mm. So <laughs> let's talk about this issue. Um, you know, this, this is the RICO case from 2007 before RICO. We have a split in authority in California. Now we know there are two things you have to do when you receive an email or any communication that wasn't meant for you. You have to stop reading as soon as you recognize that it's a privileged communication and you have to notify the other side. RICO does not say you have to destroy it which I think a lot of people overstate the holding in RICO or um, try to sort of uh, shoehorn that in. You don't have to destroy it. You can litigate about whether you're entitled to use it. Um, COPRAC recently came out with this opinion, 2013-188, uh, which has to do with a communication that a lawyer received um, from an anonymous third party who had basically stolen from um, the corporate defendant 
privileged communications that would help plain this case. And then this sneaky, super sneaky, uh, you know, deep throat type character mailed them to plaintiff's lawyer. Um, and the issue in that hypothetical was that um, based on a quick review of the documents, it appeared that the crime fraud exception applied. Um, and so the question directly posed in 2013-188 is can you use those emails if you think that the crime fraud exception applies? And the answer is still no. Even though a third party sent them, they're still akin to an inadvertent disclosure because the author and the recipient of the communication never intended for you to have them. Um, so again, stop, notify, and the other thing I would say is that if you're working under a protective order, um, really understand what those clawback provisions allow um, and make sure that you know how to invoke that if necessary. Okay, so I think this goes to um, this gentleman's question, the cloud, um, not directly, but it's a related issue, um, <coughs> you know, how we're using the cloud. Now, how many of you utilize Dropbox? Okay, so Dropbox apparently makes my IT guy very unhappy, he doesn't feel that it is as safe as other providers. Um, that is basically all I know about his opinion. We use something called ShareFile instead. Um, it's delegating, right? I have some, somebody else to tell me whether that's safe. Um, but there are two uh, opinions that are helpful here. 2012-184 uh, is the VLO opinion that I uh, referenced earlier about operating a virtual law office where you have no brick and mortar operation whatsoever and you do everything via email and through the cloud. Uh, so that's a really helpful opinion. Um, and then 2010-179, which is that Starbucks, you know, free Wi-Fi in a cafe opinion. Uh, so my practice partners here are like, pay somebody who can tell you what's good. Uh, educate yourself or hire somebody that can educate you, use uh, encryption software, even just asking the question, you know, are we, are we doing everything we're supposed to be doing um, to somebody that's competent to answer that question? Um, and then what I would say about vendors, uh, there is an ABA opinion on outsourcing and using vendors. Um, it says all of your ethical obligations still apply, so you know, it's not totally shocking. Um, but keep an eye on those and the indemnity provisions because a lot of times when you retain like an e-discovery vendor or something like that, the, the agreement is that you will indemnify them if they lose your client's confidential information, which is bananas. And you can negotiate those sometimes. Um, or you can go use a different vendor. Um, okay, so I told you this would come back up. Websites constitute a communication center to 1400. So you've got to comply with the advertising. Uh, rules, um, and I wanted to just take you back right to like the very basic, that first Copyright Opinion 2001, when there was still like a question about whether firms would ever really all have websites. Um, so just keep an eye on these things, multi-jurisdictional compliance, advertising as it relates to offering contingent fee um, arrangements, and then failing to identify a contact person, because if it's an advertisement, you've got to identify a contact person. So that's sort of like the, the, the nitty gritty um, catch all tip. Uh, tip 12, social media outlets and websites are a source of evidence. I think we are getting to a place, rule 3-3110 is our competence rule. I think we're getting to a place where you are departing from the standard of care if you're not using the internet to look up the parties against whom your client is litigating or even your own client when you're intaking um, so, example, um, plaintiff sues defendant for personal injury, uh, plaintiff and defendant agree to go to mediation, plaintiff's lawyer thinks the plaintiff has a great case, they've got a settlement demand, they go to mediation, and defense lawyer pulls out of his briefcase pictures printed from Facebook of plaintiff water skiing at the end. Uh, this was not an eye injury case. <laughs> this was a back injury, soft tissue case. So you know, the defense lawyer did the right thing and looked for publicly available information that would assist the defendant in defending that client. Um, and these are sources of evidence. Um, now, you know, we don't have um, 
we don't have, uh, well, let me tell you about the, the New York, um, and it's New York, not New York, uh, the State Bar case, uh, which has to do um, with a lawyer using various forms of social media to research potential jurors. Uh, and what New York said is that, yeah, you can look for publicly available information. So if somebody hasn't locked down their privacy settings on Facebook and they've got a fully publicly available Facebook page, knock yourself out. But if you go on a site like LinkedIn and you research somebody, and we know, or we should know, that you know every person that's looked you up on LinkedIn, you get a little notification, so-and-so is looking at your profile today. If the potential juror receives a notification like that, you have just violated your ethical obligations. So you have to know the implications of using, the consequences of using a specific kind of technology. Some forms of technology may be okay, while others, like LinkedIn in that specific example, would not be. Uh, so, the practice of winners are search everybody, witnesses, clients, uh, opposing side, um, learn about the types of technology that can be a source of evidence, uh, and accept or admit when something's outside of your competence. You can become competent by associating it with somebody else. And there may be somebody that may be um, you know, a 20-year-old file clerk in your office that can help you understand what the hell Snapchat is. Because uh, I still don't totally understand what that is, but apparently it's big deal. So, um, it's like replacing Facebook uh, for the younger generation. But in any event, tip 13, investigations via social media are not exempt, exempt from the rules prohibiting deceptive conduct. I don't know if any of you have heard about uh, the San Diego County Bar Association formal opinion that says that it is a violation of the ethical rules, including the no contact rule, to send a friend request to the other side if they're represented by counsel. Uh, even though it technically is not related to the matter, which the no contact rule is limited, uh, limited to the subject matter of the representation. Uh, they said it's, it's just deceptive. It's, it violates all these business and professional code sections that prohibit us from um, acting in a way um, that is inconsistent with the truth. So um, because there's no other reason you would be sending that person a friend request, um, you don't want to be their friend. Um, so that's a helpful rule. Yes. What if you have have a, a large friend population and some of those people are involved either for or against you on cases or some of those people end up being, uh, you know, opposing clients or right. in an arbitration, uh, uh, various attorneys may be right. uh, friends. What do you do in that situation? Yeah, so the San Diego County Bar Association hypothetical was limited to a situation where the lawyer had no other relationship, social, professional, or otherwise with this person. Um, the only connection that they have was the litigation. Um, you know, it's, it, it could be dangerous, but I think if you had a pre-existing relationship, it's probably fine. If you know that person from past cases, it's probably fine. I don't know you, sir. If you're a judge, it's probably not fine. <laughs> uh, well, so. <laughs> good guess. I'm a retired judge, and, and, and it seemed like the, the judiciary is is more sensitive about this than attorneys. Yeah. And the the only place that it really comes up for me is is when I do arbitrations, and you know, do I have to disclose if if of the three to five hundred people who are who are on my friends list? Oh yeah, this attorney is on my friends list. Yeah. Um. I, I don't think you need to disclose that. I don't think it's any different than belonging to the Contrast County Bar Association. Well, you, uh, no, no. <laughs> Sometimes you do, and and the, it seemed like the, the, the way the judiciary handled it is, if you only have 100 friends, you have to disclose it. But if you have 500, that's, you're okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're, if, you, if you're an indiscriminate <laughs> friender, you're okay. <laughs> a year ago, when I researched this issue, and I don't know what's happened since then, um, I actually did a
going to feel special, but they're one of them. Um, so it's pro probably okay. Um, but an example on this issue that's been in the news is the family law case where um, they uh, had some beautiful young women trip the husband into meeting them at a bar, getting him drunk, um, and then calling the police and having him picked up for DUI outside the bar um, so that the wife could to do it, an investigator is not allowed to do it, uh, your staff member is not allowed to do it. You have to ensure that the people that work for you are following the same rules that you're obligated to follow. Um, so don't, you can't get around it that way. Okay. Twitter, um, we haven't talked about uh, Twitter, and I know you guys are getting antsy. This is 2012-186. Just because technology makes it difficult to comply with the rules of professional conduct doesn't mean you get a pass. So Twitter allows 140 characters. If whatever it is that you want to tweet is 140 characters, but it requires a disclaimer on top of that, tough, too bad. Um, so the suggestion is to include a teaser tweet, include the disclaimer, um, and include a link to the full content, and that'll help you. Uh, but you don't get a pass. <laughs> well, it depends. If, if you intend for it to be a communication and you're ready to follow the, the rules, then that's okay, right? If you want it to be characterized as something else, like look at this article that I wrote about, um, you know, whatever, um, the apparel evidence rule, then, you know, maybe you do want it to go to your blog. Uh, okay, so let's just talk really quickly about spoliation. Um, my advice to you is, for depending on the kind of matter, you really have to think about it yourself. Uh, depending on the type of client and the type of matter, you may want to have an agreement that they refrain from using social media during the pendency of their litigation. You may have to tell a client, I will not represent you, and my representation is conditional on you refraining from using Facebook um, or Twitter or whatever. Um, so there's this case, Lester versus the Allied Concrete Company, wrongful death case, the plaintiff is the husband, grieving his wife's death, uh, and his lawyer says, you know, you should really um, clean up and then deactivate your Facebook page. Does that sound okay to you guys? Lawyer was sanctioned $580,000 and client was sanctioned $180,000. Um, clean up and then because it was the court deemed it spoliation. The court said they were evidence tampering. So it is a cautionary tale for sure. It is an extreme example. Um, you know, talking to your client about appropriate uses of social media, the risks involved, encouraging them to refrain from using it, good. Encouraging them to change, alter, remove, delete, bad. Clean up was the, the phrase they used. So you have a bonus tip about BLO. They didn't think it would come up during the presentation, but it did because we had some good, smart questions. So that's the, um, the BLO bonus tip. Um, and let me give you just a couple quick closing thoughts. I'm so over my time. So this is Chicken Little. I, I know you had Carolyn here, and she got you all pumped up to market, and then I came in and said, and then this is going to happen, and then you know, the sky is going to fall. Um, it's not It's not falling. The rules haven't changed. The rules haven't changed one iota, right? So keep that in mind, and it's a really easy place to go back to. Um, you know, again, like I said, I don't think advertising is really the bar's violation of choice. Um, so what I would say is this may not also be the best approach either. Keep calm and carry on just doing what you're doing without monitoring, evaluating, considering the implications is also risky. Um, so just make sure that you're supervising your subordinates. Um, and then, you know, we have a ton of resources um, on the bar's website, got these little books. Um, and there are a lot of places. Cal Bar, under its ethics link, has a specific link for ethics and technology now. So it's a great place to find um, information. I mentioned publication 250, uh, my three tips before you leave, just check your own website, check your disclaimer, make sure you're comfortable with it, you can look at ours uh, as well if you'd like. Google yourself, 
check out what your LinkedIn page looks like if you have it. And we'll get a demo. Um, and then tighten up your privacy settings, um, which is just my general advice for anybody. Um, uh, and then finally, if you're not sure, you can always identify and retain somebody that can give you that advice. So thank you so much, and sorry I went.